You guys, get your hazmat suits ready for this mess. Oh, hello. Don't be minding me. I'm from the county pest control. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Tanya. Today we're going to be talking about the worst books of 2022. I'm so excited to film this video because I just want a little place on my channel where I have recorded the past year's traumas the highs and the lows. Today we're going to talk about the lows and fortunately there weren't too too many bad books this year but oh man there were some really really grating and annoying books this year so let's just get right into it. I don't want the video to be too long uh, so let's just start with the very first book. If I am looking down it's because I'm checking titles and authors names and it looks like this little sun catcher is getting in my face every two seconds or whatever. I'm going to start with the honorable mentions. Usually that's kind of towards the very end, but I just want to start with that um, because there was really just one. I DNF'd, did not finish one of the books this year. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. I can't even remember it because I just don't care about it. By V.E. Schwab, Victoria Elizabeth Schwab. Yes, I found the book to be just not my cup of tea and I just had to let it go. So I, I kind of consider that a worse book. If I didn't finish it, then you didn't do your job, you know, as an author. Anyway. Okay, so the very first book that I I am going to talk about is The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold. Now it basically follows this little girl named Susie Salmon who finds herself in heaven because she was killed. So Susie is just kind of like looking over her past life. She's checking out how her killer is trying to cover his uh, tracks. She's looking at her grief-stricken family and how they're adjusting to the new way of life and also you know her friends and people in the neighborhood trading rumors as to what might have happened to her. I came to know about this book from the 2009 movie, I think, with Sir Ronan and Stanley Tucci and Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg, and so many others, Susan Sarandon. I really enjoyed the movie because of its cinematic aspect. It was just so beautiful and just well done. The music, the acting, all of it. The special effects were beautiful as well. Now, as far as Alice Siebel's work, you guys, <laughs> the sentence structure, the, the, the way that she forms the book, it just does not work for me because it is too simple. She comes up with a million and one similes. She kind of makes comparisons to very serious topics and kind of like puts it in a light levity kind of way, if that makes sense. So that I didn't really care for. Another thing that I'm sure you guys might know because The Lovely Bones is such a popular book, they kind of uh, destroy the main character's essence by the end of the book. Something that was done to her that you can't even apologize for, she does to somebody else in the end. I've talked about this in my February wrap up that I will link in the cards for you guys but and that was done a very long time ago but yeah I have to say that Alice Siebold's The Lovely Bones just did not work for me. Okay so my next book is My Grandfather Would Have Shot Me. A black woman discovers her family's not Path by Jennifer Tika. So she basically discovers one day she's in the library or something and she's just in one section looking up books and she happens to see a book that stands out and turns it around and it looks like the name, the family name is familiar to her and come to find out it was her mother. And then inside of this book, she just quickly like, you know, did like a Harvard sprint for it or whatever, a Harvard read, is that what they do? A Harvard skim for that. And she sees that the words Nazi, Holocaust, concentration, Hitler, or Third Reich, all of those kind of like hot words are in the book. And she's like, what the heck is going on? What is this? So she goes and checks out the book and she quickly finds out that her past life is not exactly what she thought it was. So the problem I have really with the book is that she kind of does this victim mentality where she is inserting herself into like a, a life that she didn't really actually experience. As difficult as that might be to know that, you know, somebody so close to you, meaning familial wise, not personal relationship wise, could be so vicious and cruel and evil. Basically somebody so vile and just terribly senseless this sick man who was this uh nazi commandant who was really feared throughout the concentration camp at i think it's krakow or auschwitz i forget which one it was or plashov i forget it's been a while since i read the book um so it forgive me for that but yeah i feel like jennifer the author just kind of places herself in situations that she really was not in if that makes sense like for example there's this one particular moment in the book that really stood out to me where she was visiting the concentration camps for example auschwitz and it was like a very cold icy cool windy day and she said that she unbuttoned her coat to feel what the victims of the holocaust felt i'm like how can you even make that kind of comparison you are really dumb you visiting a museum pretty much okay to what 
kind of hellish environment they went through. Things like that, inserting yourself and making yourself feel like I was there, or I'm truly affected by this, like I've experienced this too because he looks like me and I am him and am I this cruel? Like, you're so dumb, dumb, dumb. You guys, for like the whole aspect of her feeling that icy cold breeze is not the same as what those Holocaust victims went through. It's such a trivial and minuscule thing that you're unbuttoning your coat in 2008, 6, 11, whenever you did go visit Auschwitz and you think that that is like a comparison to what those actual victims went through. So that is one of the things I have a problem with. I can say that a high of the book is that you get to learn a little bit more about Holocaust history and just more details like Nuremberg trial information, all of the different concentration camps, some kind of um, connections with the different leaders during the Third Reich. So that's always interesting as far as history. But I think what really was just so off-putting for me and a little bit grating was how she put herself in this victimhood mentality and really just kind of like a really far stretch of uh, trying to like be included and absorbed in the history of what the Holocaust really was. So that's where I find this book to be very unnerving and it's part of my worst books of 2022 because it's like I can't get past somebody who really was not even there during such a tragic time um, to be so self-absorbed and really just looking inwardly about the situation. It's like yeah there's even a part of the story where she even goes as far as neglecting her children to go experience this victimhood kind of adventure if you could say that but yeah I just thought it was really just you're just trying to get money for this book it's a oh gosh the moment I saw this book title which is about 10 years ago now uh, maybe in 2012 ish 2011 I was like oh my gosh this sounds so interesting what do you mean my grandfather would have shot me that's what it, the book title was presented to me and I was like oh my gosh this is interesting. What does that mean? And then, um, you know, it's like, it's a hot topic. It's a hot title. And then I just wanted to see exactly what that was. And the exploration of that was that, you know, maybe you might need a little bit of therapy, but as far as, you know, stretching it out to this whole book, I think it was a money grab really. And it just leaves a bad negative taste to me. All right, guys, you guys, you see I'm smiling because it's like, I feel so topsy-turvy about this next book. Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tartuk. Tartuk, I don't know, Tuk Tuk. Mick. I don't know. Um, she's It's a tough name to pronounce because I think it is Polish. You're a Teton? Which is, uh, I one day want to visit Poland because there are so many different Catholic cathedrals there and I just can imagine that it's just a wonder. It's like, it's in my mind, I see it just a snow-capped place. <sighs> Yes. Just to give you guys a super quick synopsis of Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, let me give you the Goodreads summary here. Just got my little iPad over here. It says here, in a remote Polish village, Janina devotes the dark winter days to studying astrology, translating the poetry of William Blake, and taking care of the summer homes of wealthy Warsaw residents. Her reputation, I took a second because I just, every time I see Warsaw, I just think of the Second World War, you know, that's the first place that the Third Reich invaded. It's Poland, 1939. So that's why I'm like, ah, oh, pause. Such history there, you know? Her reputation as a crank and a recluse is amplified by her not so secret preference for the company of animals over humans. Then a neighbor, Bigfoot, turns up dead. Soon other bodies are discovered in increasingly strange circumstances. As suspicions mount, Janina inserts herself into the investigation, certain that she knows who done it. If anyone would pay her mind. Yeah. Okay, so basically this is like a thriller. I believe this also has won a Nobel Prize in literature, which is really cool. But I can say that there are aspects of the book that I liked as far as the writing. I think that Olga did a great job with her, her writing because I, I felt like I felt this impending disturbance. It felt like death warmed up in a cold village. If you've ever seen this show called Cardinal, okay, with Billy Campbell, it's just that same kind of feeling of like, bones that have been marinating and frozen in ice. It just gives me an eerie, morbid, deadly feeling. It's just very distressing. Any cold, wet thing, I don't really... I, I definitely felt that the tone of the book was there. Now, the issue, the issue of the story is that Janina, this main character here, is a complete hypocrite. She is vegan, she loves animals, and she's a complete, like, a misanthrope. Like, she's not a likable character, I can tell you that much. I can't ever see me being, like, kind and gentle 
to somebody like this. So the story goes on forever. I'll tell you that much. I felt like it was an overstuffed story to tell us that this woman, and spoiler alert here guys, this woman kills so many of her Polish village residents, neighbors, because they're hunters and they have licenses and permits and they are allowed by the government to do so. It's the law, they can do it. But I don't think you can go and murder people just because you don't like the way that they live. So this is the problem that I had with this character. I'm going to see if I can find an insert from Goodreads because somebody just described it so perfectly how I felt. I was like, oh, this is exactly what I was feeling. So. Let me just quickly look. Yeah, so here we go. Um, this is definitely something that helps me to give you guys, you know, this written text. This is by Sam Quixote. <laughs> I don't know if he's related to Don. Okay, that's a bad joke. So <laughs> this person with, I think it's a Goku, guys? Let me know. It's like, I'm gonna consult my sister off camera. It's probably Goku. <laughs> anyway, so this person wrote a review that I really do kind of like agree with. Not every little aspect of it, but for the most part, it's just this hypocritical thing that just really just got to my core. I was like, this story could have been so much more, Olga, had you not made it so like one-sided, you know? This person writes that it's basically just a screwball old lady muttering her disapproval of hunters. And she goes on these rants, you guys, in the story, like soliloquies and, and, and monologues of why things should be the way they are and I should teach you a lesson I wish I could like she just oh my god the lady went on so many damn rants I was like oh my gosh this book is too long for this okay and to find out at the very end that she is a killer like what <laughs> anyway so this person says that it's basically just a screwball old lady muttering her disapproval of hunters and hunting in general while wittering on about the poetry of William Blake and astrology. I feel like Olga, the author, can't be so stupid that she doesn't understand hunting isn't some black and white moral question. That hunters are one dimensionally evil, sadistic, macho, bloodthirsty thugs. So I'm giving her the benefit of the of the doubt that she writes them that way because her first person narrator is so unhinged. That's a that's a good word for Janina, the main character. She's a little bit unhinged, okay? And then there's this particular part in the book that really just wrote me the wrong way. There's a mass, a Catholic mass that is going on. Everybody is having a good time. They are in prayer and they're enjoying the mass. And then if you disrespect, for me, for me, personally, if you disrespect that kind of religion, that kind of like, you know, sacredness where people are coming and, and communing together, I think that is just incredibly, incredibly rude. I, I don't care what your religion is, really. I really don't. If you come and disrespect, like, some... Look at me, I, I can't even speak because it's just so rude. She, Giannina, the main character of the story, she comes and lashes out at the priest who was giving his homily in the most peaceful way. I can't even tell you. I, I, and I try not to be biased about anything like this, but the way that Miss Olga wrote it, you're making Janina look crazy. Okay, so that's one thing that I was like, oh, you're, you're, you're just, you're just, you're burying this book, man. Let me get some dirt and just, you know? But yes, continuing on with this super quick review, hunting is a much more complex issue, especially if you're a meat eater, which 95% of Western society are. Then you can't complain about someone going out to get their own meat through skill and the tradition of hunting, rather than simply buying it conveniently processed and packaged from the shop. And it's healthier to get your meat that way too. All right, I'm putting away the soapbox. Even without the politics, this is a really crummy novel. The feeble plot inches along at a glacial pace, exactly. It took forever, guys. It was taking forever. I was like, is this like a thousand pages or something? While well, we had to sit through Janina's tedious day-to-day -day activities, monologuing. Huh, what did I say? He starts monologuing. He starts monologuing. He starts monologuing. <laughs> on and on about sodding. Oh, are you from like Europe <laughs> or Brit are you British or something? Because this person says sodding. I can only see a British person saying that maybe. Sodding Jupiter in Venus's house and Sagittarius doing something with Gemini and who gives an F? Uh, what utter drivel astrology is. Then she's with her boring hippie friends wanking over Blake's poetry until all the reveals get crammed into the finale, none of which was satisfying or that interesting. Okay, they really went off a few exclamation points. We're not even gonna say that. But for me, I kind of have to agree a little bit a little bit with what this person is saying. It just kind of was a very fluffy novel. The best thing I can say about Olga's work was that her writing was really profound. It felt like the feeling of Mindhunter 
criminal minds cardinal it just has this very dreary cold morbid deadly way the setting and the atmosphere of it i just absolutely love that but then her character the main character who usually we try to find some kind of you know a relation and you try to like link up with the person try to see yourself in them and maybe empathize and just really like them that's usually how novels i would think of it didn't work out that way okay guys so after that crazy crazy book i really feel like my blood pressure is up <laughs> the next book that i have on my list is made oh my gosh by stephanie land that is really that's an interesting one uh made by stephanie land what can i say about this this is a non-fiction book about this woman who basically goes into the maid industry, the cleaning business industry. It truly is what it sounds like, maid. Not like some metaphor for anything like that. It's maid. It's called maid. So I wanted to like this book so much because I like when people are clawing their way outside of like difficult situations and that they make something of themselves. They really work hard to get to where they want to go, what they want to achieve, their goals, their dreams, their you know? They want to just explode out there and just like say, hey, I'm not this thing. I can be more than that. Alrighty, so Stephanie Lan is 28 years old. She finds herself pregnant, unmarried, and that's not that's not the that's not the argument. That's not the question. That's not the issue of the day. She finds herself in a situation where money is extremely tight, and she is living off of like welfare programs from the United States. I believe she's in Washington State, so I don't even know what kind of like you know programs they, they have over there. But it seemed like it was relatively easy for her to be able to get you know different kind of programs to help her and her daughter like snap and medicaid and pud and things like that so you guys to help pay bills she goes and signs up with the cleaning business i just you know for the moment that i was reading this i just felt like i saw like jennifer lopez a little bit made in manhattan that was what came to my mind but i was like man lady you're just not doing it right she lives in this gorgeous part of the United States I've never been but I can only imagine you guys if you think of Twilight hello the Pacific Northwest a Stephanie just starts doing just some weird stuff, okay? She has this mentality of I deserve everything and why am I not getting things that I deserve? She starts putting on patrons clothing while she's cleaning their homes. She ruffles through their items. She does a lot of crazy things that I believe a lot of sensible people would not do if they were in her situation. I certainly wouldn't. I am going to refer back to Goodreads because I actually made some notes about this particular thing and this person on good reason i was like are these people reading my mind they said exactly what i was thinking so to refer back to this because this was about a year ago that i read it i have a few points that just seem so like you guys am i crazy or am i crazy like stephanie does certain things that keeps her in kind of like a, a poverty situation she keeps herself there like it's through your own fault you, her everybody's situation is completely different you know what i mean if you have like low income issues etc cetera, etc cetera, that's not the issue at hand it's this particular person who really just like wrote this book to show you hey this is how i kept messing up at every single turn you know <laughs> let's start with this of uh this uh, review here yeah i was like um it's by katie and it's the top review i was like yes katie Yes, that's it. So I'm not even gonna read the whole thing because it, it's it's lengthy. But she says there are so many WTF moments in this book that I truly wish I could have called Land, the author, to get more facts, more of the facts. And maybe that's just par for the course with this being her first book. But ultimately, these things led me to feel the way I do. Why at 29 does she have no savings and decide to have a baby with an abusive man who has indicated he doesn't want to care for the child? That I'm like, I'm not really. Mm. That's like a. I'll give you a pass on that. How is she spending $275 a month on gas to see Jamie, which is her boyfriend, when she said that Mia, which is her daughter, only goes to him every other weekend? Excuse me, Jamie is her ex, her ex-boyfriend. My bad. Is she driving four hours both ways? When she clearly can't afford to raise Mia on her own, why was she saving baby clothes just in case she might have a baby with her then abusive boyfriend, Travis? Explain that to me. Please, somebody explain that to me. Does, does, 
how does that make any sense? You're in a situation where you have a seriously limited budget, a seriously small income, and you have a child already, and you don't particularly love the guy that you're with, and yet, right, you have like a small amount of money. How is it that you're buying baby clothes just in case? Uh, I just thought that was so crazy. I was like, that food can go to your daughter Mia who could use it. You guys are in an awful place where there's like lead paint, you know, in a dangerous neighborhood. The young girl is not eating enough like nutritious food, yet you're saving your money for a baby with an abusive man. That's some kind of like, you gotta explain that one to me, you know? And then there's this one other point that I'm gonna quickly point out. Uh Point, point. This resource can be a source. We don't say this resource can be a source. <laughs> Okay, is that, oh no, I should probably point out a couple others. There's so much. Two things, two things. I thought this was crazy. Three things. <laughs> Listen to this. When she receives a hundred dollars, and this is from Stephanie, she wrote this, and I can confirm, I read the book. When she receives a hundred dollars from her dad, why doesn't she save it for food instead of spending it on match.com? Is it more important for you to find a <laughs> That's funny. I can't. The way you're writing this, it sounds like Mia, you don't care, Mia, her daughter, you don't care about her. You're only caring about yourself. I see this is the pattern with these books. These people only care about themselves. They have a narcissistic, selfish, egocentric. Oh, that one really just killed me. Here's another one. Why was she looking at expensive private schools for Mia, her daughter? What was wrong with free public preschools or even looking at local churches? Next. This one, I almost threw the book across the room, y'all. When she receives her $4,000 tax refund, why does she buy a $200 diamond ring immediately after describing how her daughter is violently ill from the black mold in their apartment? Okay, bye. Yeah, we're gonna stop there. I think that one was really just the, I was like, wow. So you got a $4,000 tax return and the first thing you do is buy yourself a $200 diamond ring. That's what she wrote in the book. I'm not, I didn't come up with this. Like, please stop insulting me. The people who try to help you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? There's not much I can say about that. I, I thought that was so just ridiculous. I thought it was just ridiculous. Next book. <laughs> I feel like most people probably don't even have this in their worst books of 2022. I'm, I'm ashamed that I even know what this stuff is. <laughs> I'm ashamed, okay? Out with it. Um, yeah. So, right, it's um pretty much all of Allie Hazelwood's books, you guys. You know those gorgeous, cute little covers that are trending all over booktube and book talk and all of that stuff. Instagram probably even and Goodreads and whatever. All the places, you guys. Okay, how about I take you back to 1956? Hmm? <laughs> Alright, where the classic horror film Invasion of the Body Snatchers comes out, right? Okay. That's what happened to me. To me. Me. I don't know how this happened, but yes, I got caught in the train of Allie Hazelwood's terrible books, you guys. They are the exact same story. Like Xerox, carbon copy, ka -ch -ch -ch. She literally wrote all of these books the same, starting with The Love Hypothesis. And then I think it might have been Stuck With You. Uh, let me look them up. I can't even remember. It starts off with The Love Hypothesis, Under One Roof, Stuck With You, Below Zero, Love on the Brain. Yes. And she has another one coming out, it's called Love Theoretically or something. So yeah, all these books are basically the same story, just rewritten over and over again. I hear that this author has a thing for Adam Driver. I mean, I know he's, he's, he's you know, he's Adam Driver, Kylo Ren, beautiful, but it's like getting old. It's getting old. Her signature is six foot eight dude, tiny woman, science, <laughs> falls in love, and that's it. And lots of just weird fetishy type of things. Allie Hazelwood is probably somebody that I could never be friends with. I couldn't even tolerate, honestly, their presence because of how permissive, wibbly wobbly kind of writing. A lot of it is just very, um, it's very plain. It's not very beautiful and flowery and just like something that you want to absorb all the time. Even though I st when I start something, I have to finish it. That's why I have so many of those books, like boop, 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 boop. Meaning like, you know, Love Hypothesis is stuck under one roof 
with gear, whatever the hell it was called. So yeah, that's where I find fault in me. It's just I have, when I start something, I have to finish it, even though it's really, really bad. Most of the story basically just follows a girl in STEM who is getting her PhD or has her PhD and is working on some kind of major project and she finds love with her superior, her colleague, and that's just the recipe that is done. As I said, carbon copy. <laughs> And I'm like, it's just really bad to be very frank. And I think people are getting sick of it if you ever look at any of the one star reading, uh, ratings on Goodreads or whatnot. So I think it's, yeah. Okay, and you guys, probably the worst book, the worst book of 2022 has got to be Blackout by all of these authors. I could read them off to you, I guess. Danielle Clayton, Tiffany D. Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and the person that I came for was Nicola Yoon. I should have known. This is what happens when I read contemporary works. I just, ugh, like, <laughs> it's just so annoying. You guys, uh, like, can you guys do better? Basically, Blackout deals with this, like, huge heat wave that happens in New York City. I thought it was so exciting, New York City. You know, that's um where I kind of live part-time. Yes. So New York City experiences this heat wave and then of course the electricity goes out but sparks fly <laughs> between different people. Exes who are bitter, friends who known each other for a while. I was gonna say family like ew. No God please no. <laughs> Sometimes people who are meeting for the first time, which was my favorite story, a meet cute happened. I can just tell you that, again, this contemporary romance novel was just so unmoving and it was so memorable because it was so bad. It's broken up into different like sections by each author that I just rattled off two seconds ago. And like they talk to you about different couples who are meeting each other in some fashion, whether it be for the first time, if they're old friends, if they're exes. So you're just following all of these people who are in New York City experiencing the blackout and there's like romance that's like popping up and whatnot. So that's really it. I'll tell you this, there's this one line in the book that just really pissed me off because it's like, it really just like insulted my intelligence if I'm gonna be honest with you guys. It, it just kind of like assaulted me. It, it, it It's not the way you write a story. There's a moment in the book where it's so hot outside that people are playing out in the streets of Brooklyn and there are some beautiful brownstones and maybe a fire hydrant has exploded from the heat and it's like raining water to cool everybody so you can see the rays of a beautiful rainbow from the water hitting the sun in a sense you know what I'm talking about anyway there's a moment where they're talking about this dog who's going in and out of this brownstone <sighs> I can't believe I'm gonna review this and they said that the dog's bottom, his tail area, was... <sighs> the bottoms, the bottom, the dog's bottom, they wrote it like this. It looked like the dog's was twerking. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like, you guys? What you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. What is this? The dog was twerking? What are you doing? Like I bought the mental gymnastics that I had to go through when I read that, about a billion of my freaking brain cells died reading that. Do you not understand? <gasps> I was so, fr I really was pissed actually when I read that. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? Like I need to go. <laughs> I need to go back. I need to go back wherever the heck I came from. I wish I didn't pick this book up. Oh my God. You're telling me you, this is, somebody wrote that. The dogs was twerking. I was like, and I just don't like that because it just, it pulls you back into like this contemporary world of like a word like twerking is in a book. Like, what is this? Anyway, you guys, whoa. <laughs> Guys, you know, like seriously. Anyway, I felt like I got a little dumber 
I really did. I was like, oh no, 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 this is ridiculous. So that had to be the worst book I read because of that kind of writing. I was like, really, where, why am I here? I chose to be here and I could have stopped. <sighs> anyway, you guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Those were truly my worst books of 2022. I pray that 2023 brings us some really beautiful and meaningful works. I, I, I'm going to actually make a conscious effort to try to avoid, not even the trends because it just, it was a book that just popped up and I was like, oh, I know Nicole Yoon. Let me go and check her out. I've enjoyed everything, everything. And the sun is also a star. And you know, it's like, let me just see what's going on. Let's just be a little bit, let's be a little different. Let's be a little bit outgoing with our, our reading. Just know don't do that tanya tanya don't do it you're gonna regret it every time just stick to the stuff that you know so hopefully this year we can get to you know some beautiful classics that you know won't melt my brain you know so yeah that's that's what it is oh 2022 just a few books really that just was like oh, i'll never forget this for the rest of my days but yeah i really hope that you guys enjoy the video and i thank you so much for watching bye <laughs>